Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide online valuation services for mediation and litigation based in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we are discussing common questions to ask a business broker when selling a business with Jennifer Smith, a business broker in Cape Girardeau, Missouri with Murphy Business Sales. Welcome, Jennifer. How are you? Thanks, Melissa. I'm great. How are you? Good. We always love having you. But today we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to act as if I am a business owner wanting to sell my company. And kind of some of the initial questions that I might have, just if I'm on the fence or I might think I had a great 2019, maybe I had a great 2020 during the pandemic. But now I'm trying to figure out what to do next. So can we just start out with like, I don't even know what is the process to sell my company. Can you just give me some basics maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So the very first step in any process for selling the company is to establish a likely selling price for the business on the open market. Now, if you're transferring to a family member or if you already have an employee who's interested in buying it, the process doesn't change. We still have to determine what is a likely selling price or what would be a likely selling price if we were to put it on the open market. So that valuation process is very different, Melissa, from what you go through in your firm. Um, You know, you handle all kinds of very sophisticated and very complicated valuations. Uh, what we're doing is a is a um, we go through a process to value the company, but it's just for the purposes of establishing a likely selling price, and uh, we call that a broker opinion of value. I'm very proud to say that we've tracked that uh, success rate over the last ten years, and when we compare our valuations versus our actual sale prices over that ten year period, we're accurate plus or minus three percent. So um, I like to tell our sellers, you may not always like the number that we come back with, but it's accurate (laughs) in terms of predicting that price. So um, that's the very first step. That is a flat fee. Um, It's very reasonable because we want to make sure that a lot of people have access to that tool. And that's our uh, conversation where we have kind of a go, no go conversation. Sometimes uh, we don't feel like it's going to be a good fit based on the size or scope or scale of the business um, after we valued it. Um, And and we'll uh, provide some recommendations on other ways that you might want to sell it. Um, Or the seller might say, hey, you know, that's just not enough for me right now. Or I'm not really comfortable with um, the way this business would be sold in its current state and the the structure of of the deal and how likely that would be. So, um, you know, and other times everything is all systems go and we move forward and we list the business for sale. Oh, see, that is very interesting because I've actually had clients that I have sent um, to you and other people and instead of getting a valuation with me, I usually do encourage them to get that valuation with the broker or the investment banker, because you're really pricing it for the market and what could be reasonably attained and, Mm -hmm. and setting the expectation for the seller. So I think that's really important that it's just having a business valuation by anybody and then taking that valuation to a broker, it doesn't necessarily, like everybody's going to have a different opinion of -hmm. what they can get done, right? So it's really important that you get that price from the person who's going to help you sell that company. Right. And at the end of the day, uh, I don't know any brokers or investment bankers that would take someone else's valuation and, and stake their compensation on it right? Because at the end of the day, the interest of the broker and the seller are aligned. Um, Because um, the way you should be working anyway, not not everybody, I guess, but the way it should work is that uh, the seller doesn't pay the broker anything until the seller gets paid, right? So um, the broker has an incentive to really get that value correct, because if it's too low, then both the seller and the broker are leaving money on the table, And if it's too high, then the broker's working for free and the seller's wasting time. Mm -hmm. Right. So really, there's a there's a very um, there's very strong alignment there to get that number right. So now if if they come in and they say, okay, 
are there a few, cause I know there's much more to the process, but like they say, okay, now I have to do this small valuation. And I will say your current pricing and traditional pricing is far lower than what you're going to pay for a traditional valuation. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's not a, uh, it, it's, it is a small fee, but it gets everybody on the same page when they start that process. Are there a couple, do- again, since it's not a full blown valuation, what are the documents that they really should bring to that first step? Yeah. So we're looking at the three past three years of tax returns for the business. I want a current trailing 12 month P and L and profit uh, and loss. Please. Yes. The profit and loss. And I want a current balance sheet. And um, based on that, I'll have some additional questions. Sometimes I'll ask to see W2s or sometimes I'll ask to see a depreciation schedule or something like that. But really that last three years of tax returns, a trailing 12 month profit and loss and a balance sheet, that's that's usually enough to get the conversation started. Okay, so now we did the valuation, you know, you did the valuation, you came to me and you said, I think I can sell your company for a million dollars. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Now what do we do? So at that point, if the client feels comfortable with it and we feel comfortable with it, I'll prepare an engagement agreement. Uh, Everything that we do is via e-signature because uh, we're working in all all four time zones every day, right? So we're located in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, but only about 20% of the deals that we do are are even, would even be considered local. Everything else is outside of our market. Um, So I'll prepare an engagement letter. I'll send it over to you for uh, electronic signature. At that point, we'll start to build what's called a confidential information memorandum or SIM, C-I-M. And Kate here in our office will prepare that document with the client. And that really goes into a a pretty deep dive about the business and anything that we can think of that a buyer might want to know about that company, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because we don't want to, uh, we don't want to sugarcoat it, right? Um, Then from there, we're going to prepare a... um, a public listing that's very confidential. It's going to say something, you know, for for Melissa, if you were a a restaurant owner, we would say something like uh, a restaurant doing 3 million in sales in Eastern Missouri. Well, good luck deciding where that restaurant is going to be or who that is, right? right? So that's how we're going to market that blindly and nationally on about 20 different business for sale websites. And if a client, if a buyer wants to see that confidential information memorandum, find out the identity of the business and learn a little bit, little bit more about them, they're going to have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And so that non-disclosure agreement is binding. And uh, if they um, let the cat out of the bag and harm the business in any way, then, then the seller has every right to enforce that non-disclosure. So once we find uh, the buyers, we vet them and we may go through two, three, five dozen buyers. Uh, before they ever meet a seller, because we want to make sure that the buyer is ready, willing, and able to do the deal um, before we take the seller away from their business and start engaging them in conversations that are going to kind of cause them to lose focus for just a little bit. We want them uh, really focused on maintaining and growing their business while we're going through this process. And part of that is maybe trying to make sure that these people aren't just trying to figure out who's selling Mm -hmm. their business and they maybe have the financial funds to actually buy the business, right? That's that's right. We call, uh, we call folks tire kickers, right? They're just the ones that are out. They don't have much to do that day. They're kind of being nosy. Sometimes it's a competitor. um, And we want to, we want to ferret that out and make sure that they never get the confidential information on the business in the first place. Sure. Um, Or if they can't afford to do the deal, we, 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 you know, we see that quite often. Somebody will say, well, I've saved up $10,000. I want to buy a business. Okay. Well, (laughs) that's not going to get you very far. Um, So, you know, we do a lot of that work on the, on the front end so that we don't have to uh, waste the time of the seller for sure. And it's helpful because uh, some of these deals could be done through SBA lending. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and we've had some deals that the SBA couldn't fund because the individual who was buying it maybe didn't have a great financial track record um, in general. So knowing some of those things at the beginning may prevent issues later on in the process. 
That's right. That's right. So assuming that we find a, a good qualified buyer uh, who wants to do the deal, or if it's, if it's an internal candidate or a family member that you want to sell to, that's fine too. Uh, we help with those and those fees are greatly reduced because we don't have to go find a buyer. Um, <clears throat> But the uh, the buyer will I'll typically uh, facilitate a buyer seller meeting so they can ask questions either in person or or maybe via Zoom call of the seller. Uh, once they get comfortable with everything, we'll prepare an offer for the buyer. We'll negotiate that and get the deal under contract. Um, once it's under contract, we enter what's called a due diligence period. That's an opportunity for the buyer to really look under the hood of the business and ask to see anything that might be a potential deal breaker for them. They'll want to see contracts and employment uh, records. They'll want to see um, invoices and, and they'll have you run QuickBooks reports and talk to the accountant, things like that. Um, once that process is complete, we help the buyer find the financing if that's an element of the deal. We're seeing a lot of seller financing right now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if we're doing external financing, we'll help secure that for the buyer. Um, then we hire a third party attorney to draft the closing documents. And that's a really important piece to this because, um, you know, there's a lot of money spent in hiring a buy side attorney and a sell side attorney in a smaller deal and a bigger deal that's appropriate. But in a smaller deal, there's a lot of money spent hiring two, se two separate attorneys whose job it is to kind of pull things from one side to the other, right? When we've already negotiated the deal, it's already fair and down the middle. And all we need to do is document that deal. So I hire the third party attorney to draft the closing documents. I hold escrow. Um, so uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the buyer's funds being with any third party where maybe we can't get it back if a contingency is triggered. Um, and um, then we at that point, we move on to the closing table. We get the deal closed. Um, we uh, release funds in the escrow account, transfer ownership, and walk the buyer through what they need to do to uh, get the business uh, um, back up and running. So um, really, and, and you don't miss a beat at that point. You know, the employees don't know what happened until it happened, right? So they didn't have time to get nervous because we didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. The vendors didn't have time to get nervous and start squirreling around with terms. The competition had absolutely no idea what was happening, so they couldn't get squirrely on you, right? And uh, really, we just kind of emerge with a new owner. Nobody had time to get nervous. The business doesn't miss a beat, and everybody just keeps doing what they're doing. The machine keeps going. So that's really the ideal scenario in a small business sale. Now, things get a lot more complex as we go up the food chain a little bit and we get into lower middle market businesses. But those main street businesses under call it about three to five million in enterprise value. That's typically how things work. Sure. And when people get involved, like let's say that the business is a smaller business, you know, what just kind of conceptually, what is the cost structure of working with a business broker or an investment banker in order to sell your your company? Because there are costs involved um, mm -hmm. and and sometimes those are you know absorbed by the seller. Yeah, most of the time the seller uh, is going to pay for the fees um, and most of the time it's going to come out of their proceeds. So if you if you encounter an investment banker or a business broker who wants a monthly retainer for not selling your business, your interests are not aligned, right? You want that success fee on the back end. Um, typically, you're going to see business brokers in the smaller companies, in those main street businesses that are in that Three to, under three to five million in enterprise value. You'll also see some business brokers like us that go up to about 50 million, right? Which is considered lower middle market. You're not going to find any investment bankers in the main street sector. Um, those investment bankers are, are in the much larger deals. They're going to be in that 20, 20, probably 25 million and up range is where you're going to find an investment banker. Um, but the smaller deals, to answer your question, those are going to have a higher percent attached and they're going to have a minimum attached because they take a lot of time and effort um, and they're not big companies. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a small deal um, that may be at, at, at a 12 percent um, fee if we have to find the buyer and there may be a minimum attached to that, whereas a larger deal may be one and a half or two percent with no minimums. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so it just, it kind of depends on the size and scope and scale complexity. Do we have to find a buyer? Do you already have the buyer? Uh, all of those things play into the costs that are involved. So I like to tell folks, you know, there's, there's a, a very reasonable cost for the business valuation. After the business valuation is complete, um, then we're going to be able to tell you exactly what your costs are going to be because we're going to know the business at that point um, and we know what's going to be involved in selling it. So at that point, we can do a really good job of pricing the structure. And one other thing that I think is important for people to understand is there's a concept, which I actually learned from you, um, about being either a dual broker or working with the buyer and seller. Um, mm -hmm. How does that work and what does that look like? Yeah, so anybody that's familiar with real estate has heard of a dual broker, um, and those are scary concepts, right? Because in, in, in dual brokerage, you represent the buyer and the seller, and you're thinking, well, how could your fiduciary obligation or your, um, your allegiance be to two different sides, right? And the answer is, I don't have the first clue how you do that. Right. Um, so dual brokerage is, is a scary concept. It happens in real estate, but not so much in business brokerage. Um, what you want in business brokerage is a transaction broker. A transaction broker in real estate and in uh, business brokerage represents the deal itself. They don't represent the buy side or the sell side, even though the sell side usually pays the fee. Their fiduciary obligation is to the deal itself. So if the buy side and the sell side want to get a good, fair deal done. It's the broker's job to represent the deal and get it across the finish line for those parties, right? So, um, and, and honestly, I can't imagine not being a transaction broker because I wouldn't want to be adversarial with my seller or my buyer. And I wouldn't want to unnecessarily complicate the deal by bringing in another broker, right? where we're trying to figure out, you know, who's representing who and, and, and whatnot. So this transaction brokerage concept is by far the, the, the most fair kind of lean and mean way to get a business deal done uh, and get one done quickly because your broker who represents that deal wants to get it done quickly for both sides so that everybody can get what they're after, right? And, and get on with their lives. <laughs> Um, there's, sure. there's no billable hours. There's no dragging it from one side to the other side, to the other side, to the other side, and wasting a lot of time and money doing it. Uh, the other, the other thing I would say is, you know, you're not writing anybody a blank check. If the business doesn't sell, you don't owe anybody anything. Mm -hmm. and that's a pretty, that's a pretty nice concept for a lot of sellers. It de-risks the transaction for them. Now for to be a transactional broker, is that going to be in all deals or is that only if um, a potential buyer comes and maybe needs some additional assistance? Because a lot of times small businesses are bought by other owner operators. Mm -hmm. And so is that typically when you would see it or do you see it all the time? Um, uh, we're almost all the time transaction brokers. Um, the only way that we would not act in that capacity is in probably a lower middle market deal where we get brought in um, by the buy side because there's already a sell side broker and they feel that they need adequate representation or if they want us to handle their due diligence or something like that. Okay. Um, we would say nine times out of 10 transaction broker status is the way you want to go. In general, a business owner, if they are considering, even at this point in time um, or any time in the future, that they're like, well, I'm thinking maybe uh, it's a good time. I don't really know. I need to figure it out because I think we we put on the back burner, you know, things to do for the future. Um, but what you're basically saying is that the first step is a small fee to get a valuation, to set the price. And then you talk about what the other fees would look like, the timing, how long it's going to take, what are the additional costs. And at that point, that seller can say, well, maybe I'm ready now, or mm -hmm. maybe I now know what I need to do and I could be ready later. Yeah. And you know that you bring up a great point, Melissa. If, if you're three to five years out, on a, on a business sale where you're thinking, yeah, I think I want to start positioning for retirement, get evaluation done now. Let's figure out where you're at. 
and where the business is today and see if you're happy with that. If you're happy with it, then just keep on keeping on and in three to five years, we'll sell it, right? But more often than not, the seller is thinking, gosh, I wonder what I could do to boost the value over the next three to five years to get a higher selling price when I'm ready to retire. And because our interests are aligned, we love those conversations, right? So sometimes we'll do a business valuation three or four times over a three or four year period for a client and watch them ratchet up that value, right? And we'll coach and, and help them. We actually have a program called Value Coaching where we help them along the way, increase the value of the business and value it every year. And then when we hit that magic number that they're comfortable with and that their financial planner is comfortable with so that they don't outlive their money in retirement, um, then we pull the trigger and then we move forward selling the company. So we tell people, you know, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> right. So start the conversation early and value early and often. It's just, it's, it's not a difficult process and it's not expensive. There's really no barrier to, to um, securing that. Well, and I think that that's an important um, note to understand because I think in general, um, business owners kind of have a concept, right? And and they might say, well, if I could sell my business for $3 million, then I could, you know, live out the rest of my years and fine and be perfectly happy. The problem is <clears throat> they kind of create that number in their head of what it would be ideal. And part of the process, you know, even planning ahead for three to five years is really getting the real price, you mm -hmm. know, from somebody who is selling businesses, you know, pre pandemic, post pandemic, during pandemic, mm -hmm. and really knows what the market is pricing these particular types of companies. And so once you get that a little bit of a reality check, I think, then you can make some really good decisions um, because some people might take a little bit less now because they just don't want the headache going mm -hmm. forward. But it, it puts the decision process back in the seller's court, um, but it gives them a realistic view of the price. You're so right. And, and I'm so glad you said that because uh, you and I, Melissa, both know it's not based on revenue. It's not based on debt and it's not based on potential, right? right. So um, if you have in your mind, oh, my business has so much potential, somebody's going to pay me a million dollars for it. That's just not how it works. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, it's better to get real with the number. You know, don't bury your head in the sand. Let's get real with the number. Let's find out what a likely deal structure is and what the buyer pool looks like. And uh, we will never, ever push you into selling if you're not ready. Um, We'll just have a good conversation with you, let you know what your options are, uh, and then make a decision together on how to best move forward. That's awesome. Well, we've layered kind of down your website, your email address, and your phone number. Um, what we encourage um, business owners to do is to reach out and just go through that first phase and try to get an idea of what it looks like so that you can make some decisions going forward or set a timeline if that's the case, um, especially if there are family members involved or um, employees and things like that. So um, this was excellent information. I appreciate it, Jennifer. Um, and do you have anything else to kind of encourage them to do? You know, just reach out. We're, we're easy to talk to. We're uh, not scary at all. I promise. <laughs> We're not judgmental. We're not judgy people. Um, yeah. So, you know, whether your business is booming and you had a phenomenal 2020 maybe, um, and you've had a great last couple of years or whether things are, have been kind of tough for you, whether you're big or small, just reach out. Let's have a conversation. It's not going to cost you anything. Um, let's enter into a dialogue and, um, uh, Thank you so much. We appreciate it. It cut out a little bit at the end, but um, we, we you have all of our information. And if you have more questions, please reach out. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Melissa. Have a good day. You too.